Good evening and welcome everyone. Thank you all for coming tonight for the final installment of the Paul Revere Memorial Association's 2020 Lowell Lecture Series, a series made possible by the continued support and generous funding from the Lowell Institute. My name is Robert Shemp and I'm the Research and Adult Program Director for the PRMA. We're so glad that you're here tonight that you can join us from wherever you're viewing from around the world. Um, we're, we're so grateful for your attendance and we've got a really good program lined up for you tonight. Uh, tonight's program is going to continue our examination of climate change in Boston from a historical perspective. And tonight we're going to transition into the 20th and 21st centuries after we've previously looked at uh, 17th, 18th century Boston with uh, Anya Zilberstein and then last week more 19th century look at ice and the process of, of climate change uh, with Andrew Robichaud over Boston in, in that century. So we're, we're moving ahead a little bit um, with three distinguished panelists tonight. Uh, as we've done in previous weeks, we will have our program and then open it up to your questions at the end. Uh, for everyone watching, please feel free to send in questions in the chat on whatever platform you are joining us on tonight, either YouTube or Facebook. And we'll definitely leave some time for a Q and A at the the end to get in as many of your questions as we can. Uh, as a heads up, and I'll, I'll remind everyone at the end as well, both this lecture and our previous lectures um, are available for uh, viewing uh, after the fact on both Facebook and YouTube. So if you miss something, if you want to share it with a friend afterwards, if you want to uh, hop in and out and and, and catch some more later, uh, you can absolutely do that on on both of the platforms. So uh, for tonight, I'm going to introduce our presenters, our three presenters in the order that they'll talk tonight. Uh, each one's gonna talk for about 10 to 15 minutes and we'll give them some time if they wanna respond to each other, if, if points of conversation come up in their talks. And then again, we'll open it up to, uh, to your thoughts and insights at the end. So leading us off tonight is Zoe Davis. Zoe serves as the Climate Ready Boston Program Coordinator at the Environment Department. As a project coordinator, she supports the development of neighborhood climate resilience planning, the integration of climate change preparedness projections into municipal projects planning and permit review, and the development of resources for residents, small businesses, and other stakeholders to take action. Previously, Zoe served as a land stewardship coordinator at TerraCore Service Member with the Mystic River Watershed Association. There, she organized habitat restoration projects in public parks and partnered with community groups and local government to create climate education programs and forums for public discourse about coastal resilience. Zoe received a Bachelor of Science in Biology with an environmental science concentration from Gordon College. Uh, next up after Zoe will be Amy Longsworth, the director of Boston's Green Ribbon Commission, a role she's held since 2015. The Green Ribbon Commission is a group of 34 business, philanthropic, and civic leaders who support the progress of the city's climate action plan. Uh, the GRC convenes efforts to achieve a climate resilient and carbon-free Boston. In her role as director, Amy works with member organizations and other partners from across Boston's business philanthropic and public sectors to help the city implement its climate action plan. Previously, she spent many years as a corporate sustainability strategy consultant, uh, most recently with PricewaterhouseCoopers. Her other previous roles included being a partner at Virta Strategy Group and vice president of corporate programs at the Nature Conservancy. Uh, Amy received her MBA from Harvard and her BA from Wesleyan University. Finally, uh, Nina Zanieri, the executive director for the Paul Revere Memorial Association uh, will anchor our program. Nina has held her role with the PRMA since 1986. Previously, she was curator at the Rhode Island Historical Society. She's also served as vice chair of the American Alliance of Museums from 2002 to three and on the board for four years as well. She served as president of the New England Museum Association from 1998 to two, two, through 2002, I should say after many years of service on the board. She currently sits on the board of the Freedom Trail Foundation and is also involved with several North End community groups. She received a NEMA Lifetime Achievement Award in 2015 and was one of, four of, one of 14 finalists for the 2019 Commonwealth Award. 
Nina has a BA in history from Boston College and an MA in anthropology slash museum studies from Brown University. So we have a brilliant panel. Uh, each uh, of our three panelists will talk a little bit about their uh, experiences and their work in Boston, and we'll open it up after that. So with the introduction sorted, I'll hand it over to Zoe to kick us off. So Zoe, feel free to take it away. Thanks so much, Robert. Um, it's great to be here with you all tonight, uh, virtually, of course. Um, as Robert said, my name is uh, Zoe Davis, um, and I'm with the um, City of Boston's Environment Department as a Climate Resilience Program Coordinator. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk about um, future climate risks and um, briefly a recent history of climate adaptation initiatives that are preparing the city for the impacts of climate change. So Boston is a city that is not foreign to change. Um, over the years, as you can see uh, from the image on the left, the structure of the city and its coastline has been shaped uh, by development. And now we see the effects of climate change uh, through the, the image on the right, um, impacting the structure of the city and its coastline, um, the infrastructure, our natural resources, and our communities and people. So looking back um, at the image on the left here um, is an image of the original coastline in 1630, the year that uh, the city of Boston was founded. And it's overlaid with the current coastline um, as of 2016 um, in yellow. And what this outlines is the tremendous amount of change that has occurred over the centuries. Taking a look again at the image on the right, um, we can see future climate risk. Um, in the year 2070. Um, and you can see the footprint of the same historic coastline uh, in this future flood risk model as sea level is predicted to rise and as wetlands um, reclaim the area. So you can especially see that in um, the South Boston area, downtown, um, East Boston and Charlestown. Um, this is an image of the marina uh, during a 2019 king tide. It's a pretty intense image um, showing the power of storms and waves. Um, Boston is currently experiencing um, these harsher storms, uh, greater amounts of precipitation and longer heat waves. And so as we prepare for future risk, we prepare with the understanding that the impacts are being experienced right now. So how do we prepare for the impacts of climate change? Um, the city has been active in this preparation um, over the years. Um, these are just a, a, the, a few of the goals uh, from the city's climate action plan. Um, and so the action plan outlines the necessary steps that we need to be taking to reach our climate goals. Um, and so these goals include reducing carbon emissions and reducing waste. Um, as well as increasing mobility and shifting to safer and uh, more reliable transit and active transportation. Um, and of course, adapting our infrastructure and preparing our communities for this future change. And today I'm gonna focus um, on the climate adaptation piece through the city's uh, Climate Ready Boston initiative. So Climate Ready Boston is an initiative to develop resilient solutions to prepare the city's uh, residents, its infrastructure, and its natural resources for the long-term effects of climate change. And what this looks like is assessing the vulnerabilities and identi identifying the necessary interventions that will reduce climate impacts over the century. And when we think about um, adapting and adaptation Yes, we're looking at infrastructure, but we're also looking at people and building social resilience as well. And at its core, Climate Ready is built around the understanding that Boston can thrive within the context of climate change. And that is if we take bold action to adapt starting now. Um, so in 2016, along with uh, the Climate Ready Boston report, a vulnerability assessment identified um, four main uh, climate impacts and three main risks. 
So these are, as you can see, extreme temperatures where we're looking at extreme heat, specifically extreme precipitation um, and sea level rise giving way to stormwater flooding and um, coastal storms along with sea level rise giving way to coastal and riverine flooding. So I'll just walk through um, those uh, climate risks right now, uh, moving from stormwater to heat into uh, coastal flooding. What we can see here is a map of uh, stormwater flood risk. Um, much of the flooding that we all see um, is in the sort of uh, near term to midterm um, from the 2030s to the 2050s. Um, and then you know there there are also um, you can see uh, flood risk increasing um, more so in the south uh, the South Boston downtown area um, in the 2070s and onwards and so just to give a comparison um, to what we see today um, by the mid century we could be seeing um, incredibly heavy precipitation events um, with more than six inches of water within a given 24 hour period. Um, and this is about the average um, height of a city curb, um, or I should say the, yeah, the, the average height of a city curb and about 20% more than what we're getting right now. Um, so yes, there is immense um, future risk, but as you can see on the image um, on the left, Taken, uh, not too long ago, that the there is current risk today. Uh, heat risk, many of you uh, may know and may have experienced firsthand. Um, extreme heat is a significant risk, uh, health risk in the city of Boston, and according to the CDC, um, extreme heat causes more climate deaths, uh, climate-related deaths in U.S. cities than any other climate-related risk. Um, so maybe some of you experienced um, last summer, um, 2019 reached record highs in, in July. It was the hottest month on record. Um, and the graph, so the graph on the right uh, shows the modeled progression of extreme heat days, um, where currently we're seeing on average 11 days uh, over 90 degrees. Um, this is as of uh, 2015, but by the end of the century, we could be seeing up to 90 days um, over 90 degrees um, by 2070. Um, so summers are getting hotter and with more heat waves and more hot days, uh, we have increased heat island exposure. Um, and the reason why this is significant is because heat waves um, affect um, folks who are more uh, vulnerable to heat, such as children, um, older adults, individuals with pre-existing health conditions that can be exacerbated by heat. Um, and so, you know, as we're moving throughout the century, we can see that even though we're experiencing heat um, significantly right now, um, heat risk is projected to rise. And finally, uh, coastal and uh, riverine flooding. Um, this is again uh, the map that we saw earlier of um, 2070 uh, flood risk, uh, where we could see up to 36 inches of sea level rise. Um, and so for coastal flooding, we're really looking at three different scenarios. This is only the more long term uh, flooding scenario. Um, but we also look um, at the more near term 2030, where we could be seeing um, nine inches of sea level rise um, in the midterm, uh, 2050s, we could be seeing 21 inches of uh, sea level rise. And then, um, as you can see here, um, 36 inches of sea level rise by the near end of the century. So what then is the overall approach uh, to climate adaptation um, and how do we prepare for um, climate in uh, the long term? We take a layered approach with integrated systems 
Um, and also uh, by coordinating um, with uh, city and state agencies, with our community partners, as well as across the region with other municipalities, um, our, our neighboring municipalities and, and those across the, the Metro Boston area. Um, the 2016 uh, Climate Ready Report um, sort of took all of this information from the vulnerability assessments, um, from the projections, and it recommended a series of strategies and initiatives that would help Boston become more resilient. And this graphic uh, from the report really illustrates the layered approach uh, to climate adaptation that the city is taking. Um, so some of these initiatives include protected shores, um, interventions such as um, flood protection um, at the harbor to reduce storm surge, um, building resilient infrastructure, either by uh, modifying existing infrastructures or creating new infrastructure that allows for effective functioning under future climate conditions, um, and adapting buildings. Now, this includes efforts to retrofit existing buildings or to make uh, new buildings resistant. And of course, preparing and connecting communities. And this can be done by planning efforts and operational protocols that will increase our community's uh, capacity to and ability to thrive under uh, future climate conditions. So here is um, a timeline of a few recent uh, climate adaptation and planning efforts, um, just at a glance, just to name a few. I'll note that not all of these are headed by the Environment Department. However, all of these are initiatives that have been outlined in the Climate Ready Boston report as part of the city's wider initiative to prepare for climate change. Um, so starting with Climate Ready Boston and the Resilient Boston Harbor, again, CRB is the overarching plan uh, for climate adaptation. Um, which outlines the need for district scale planning, among other initiatives. Um, and the Resilient Boston Harbor vision is a visualization of a future where the coast is protected and communities are connected to the coast. And so all of the subsequent coastal resilient solutions um, that I'll get into in just a bit are part of actualizing this vision. Um, so phase one of East Boston and Charlestown coastal resilience uh, critical areas that were identified as being immediately susceptible to coastal uh, flood damage uh, were prioritized um, as part of the first coastal resilience plans in 2017. Um, coastal resilience in South Boston followed shortly thereafter in uh, 2018. Um, and following the BPDA um, released their uh, climate resiliency design guidelines um, published to provide guidance for ways that buildings can be more resilient against flooding. Um, coastal resilience solutions for the North End downtown and uh, the Dorchester area um, began last year. And moving into uh, the current uh, time here, we're now looking forward to releasing them very soon. And moving right along here, we're also looking forward to returning to uh, the rest of um, the Charlestown and East Boston coastlines um, to begin a phase two of coastal resilience planning there. Um, and once these uh, planning processes are completed, the city will have completed coastal resilience planning for the entire 47 miles of Boston shoreline. Um, through the Parks Department, the city is well on its way to developing a plan uh, to continue to grow and maintain the urban forest, which is um, a critical natural resource for climate resilience and mitigating heat and flooding. And finally, we are so excited and looking forward to developing a citywide heat resilience plan. This plan will build on existing heat preparedness work um, and it will explore a suite of potential adaptation strategies that will prepare for rising temperatures in the long term. Um, so with that, thank you all uh, very much. And I will turn it over to Robert. Excellent. Thank you so much, Zoe. Thank you so much for that. That was excellent. And definitely some points of conversation that I think we'll, uh, we'll have to circle back to uh, 
uh, at the end here. Um, so with that, um, next up we have Amy on the second leg here. So I'll hand it over to, to Amy Longsword. Thank you, Robert. Let's see if we can make the screen share work here. Okay, and let me put it into slideshow mode. Are you seeing the full screen? Robert? We're, yes, we're good to go, Amy. Yep. Okay, That's great. Straight. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and good evening. Um, thank you for bearing with us in our technical conversations. <laughs> um, I'm really pleased to be here, and I'm really pleased to um, follow Zoe, and um, because so much of the story that she tells um, the Green Ribbon Commission has been part of and um, continues to work closely with the city on the resilience as well as the mitigation work. So I, um, I'm trying to stay in the 21st century and the future, but I couldn't um, entirely do it. But I want to I want to talk about uh, the importance of, of um, mobilizing people and creating vision. Um, and how kind of change is the only constant that we know in this city. So beautiful Boston floating on the water. We all know we're a low lying city. Um, this is a slightly different uh, take on some of the things Zoe was just showing you. So 1630 is the um, sort of the brick color there. That was the landmass above water. That's the equivalent of her white um, in her slide. And then uh, it was landfill after that. So the brown area was filled between 1630 and 1880. And then um, the sort of the gray steel blue was um, landfilled after 1880. So a lot of our city is, is landfill. Um, this is just an interesting uh, historical tidbit that, um, well, where did all this landfill come from? Well, there used to be three small mountains or hills here in Boston, the Trois Montagne, that's how we got the Tremont Street. And guess what? Now we only have half of one, which is Beacon Hill. Um, and the other half of that, of Beacon, and the other two hills um, are were just leveled and trundled on down to the harbor for um, to expand the landmass for a growing city. Later, um, in the 19th century, we started bringing in um, fill from Needham and other, um, what's now our suburbs, via rail. And um, even after the Great Fire, we used rubble. So this is the same map Zoe had. We did not coordinate very well, but I have a different point to make, which is that if you see the sort of the orange outline, which is the, the current day um, shoreline and note, we, so that's all the landfill. Now lo, we're, note where we've put some of our most critical infrastructure. The airport in red, the seaport is that green dot, North Station is the yellow, and the lavender is uh, Faneuil Hall and Government Center. So um, that's all built to a, an, a, a standard of one foot um, above, um, one foot above sea level, circa, 18, whatever. Um, but as uh, in the immortal words of Cole Porter, um, times have changed since the, uh, since the pilgrims landed on Plymouth Rock. So today, um, this is the Boston tide gauge is literally a little marker out in the harbor that measures high tides from 1950 to 2016. And you can see what's happened. So the, um, since 1850, the harbor has risen by uh, eight inches and that rate of increase is accelerating. Um, and we currently have problems. You remember the floating dumpster storm of 2018, which is currently affecting not only businesses, that was Long Wharf and the aquarium, you remember the sandbags at the aquarium tea stop, um, but some valuable cultural resources as well, which I believe folks in this audience care a lot about, I care a lot about, um, but the Harbor Islands have important archeological sites that are just literally getting washed away. And um, heat 
you know, we know what the projections are from the study that Zoe referred to, but we also don't really need a study to know that Boston's getting hotter. And um, so hotter, wetter, saltier is kind of the motto uh, of the day. And again, this just goes to how things are changing. And this is one of my favorite little side stories about how things have changed. So what do you think connects this fork and knife set to this site in the seaport? Um, well, as a team from Skanska was beginning excavation um, on Seaport Boulevard um, for a 17 story, 400,000 square foot office tower in 2018, it might've been 17, I forget. Um, they found this ghost of a boat that apparently had run aground, crashed in a storm or possibly burned and sank um, right there in what was then shallow water and forgotten about. And so that, that fork and knife were uh, apparently, you know, what the captain used to eat dinner. And I just, to me, that's so ghostly to think that that's there, we're finding it. It wasn't really that long ago. And what we have to look forward to is yet very different again by 2070. Um, this is a, uh, a, a flood map showing in dark blue, just the monthly high tide. In the medium blue would be uh, a 10% chance storm per, like that means that you, in any given year, you would have, there would be a 10% chance of having a storm that would force the water up that high. Doesn't mean you will have it, but there's that percent chance. And then in light blue is the 1% chance storm. And again, I put in the very helpful dots of where are, are some of the key pieces of infrastructure. Um, and that is going to affect large pieces of our residential neighborhoods, um, downtown business, South End, Seaport, um, and of course, important historic and cultural sites. So let me shift gears. Um, briefly and talk a little bit about the Green Ribbon Commission itself. Uh, a lot of people are curious about the Green Ribbon Commission. And um, as far as we know, my colleague John Cleveland and I, who are the two staff people, we, this is the only, Boston is the only city that has an organization like the Green Ribbon Commission. So it's 36, um, leaders of institutions who came together uh, voluntarily to focus on helping the city uh, address climate change issues. So there are fair, you know, most cities have different kinds of private sector groups and they do a lot of different kinds of things, economic development and so on. This is the, this is purely focused on climate. And it started under Mayor Menino. It continued under Mayor Walsh. Uh, he's under, not in the sense that it's a government organization because it's not, it's private, meant to be a partner to the city. But the mayor does co-chair it along with Amos Hostetter, <coughs> who is um, a founding board member of the Barr Foundation. And uh, we have leaders from so there, sometimes it's the top person, like in the case of Boston University, the president, Bob Brown, sits on the Green Ribbon Commission. In other case, it's just a, se it's a senior leader. But we have um, leaders from universities, hospitals, um, cultural institutions, commercial real estate, the utilities, some philanthropies, some key nonprofits like the Aquarium and Boston Harbor Now and Ceres who are very deeply involved in this issue, either because of their location or because of that's what their mission is. And um, we work in sectors in, uh, and a lot of senior staff, it's not only the members, but it's the, the organizations behind them and the senior staff who really put their shoulder to the wheel and work extremely closely with the city on their climate work like Climate Ready Boston that jo Zoe just talked you through. Um, but we can do things that the city can't sometimes. We can raise private money much more nimbly than they can. We can go and talk to people and have certain conversations that the city cannot have. We can get the private sector organized. 
Um, we can reach out through trade associations in a way that sometimes, you know, we, we provide sometimes some cover and sometimes some financial assistance and sometimes some expertise to help the city move along. And in all of that, it is a pretty unique organization. Um, I have highlighted cultural institutions here because not only are we very pleased that the Paul Revere Memorial Association is a member of that working group, but I want to talk about it a little later because I think it's so important to um, what we have to do together in Boston to achieve our goals in climate. So one of the big things that the Green or GRC, I'll call it, has done um, is, is really help the city get organized. So the big two uh, around climate change. So the two big strategic thrusts, climate ready Boston, which Zoe talked about, um, and it was the call, it was the GRC's um, uh, higher ed working group that did the original study that was the first step of that work that looked at what climate, what sea level rise impacts and other climate impacts can we expect in this city in a way that was very, very particular Boston, not just sort of all East Coast or all New England. Um, and then the other thread or thrust is carbon free Boston. How do we reach our goals of carbon neutrality, which the mayor has officially adopted, which is ultimately the way to win over climate change is to eliminate all carbon um, from our man-made activities. About 30 to 50 years of carbon is now baked in. So for those of you who are in my age bracket, there's not a lot we're gonna see change for the rest of our lives, but hopefully for our great grandchildren, if we can tackle this now and solve it, we will have made a big difference. Um, so Zoe mentioned these planning studies and I, the, the areas where the planning studies are mostly completed now are outlined in these yellow dots. And I just wanted to point out the one I've circled here is Seaport South Boston. That little red dot, that's our boat, you remember. Um, and then to zoom in, it's not a great slide, but upper left there, though Fort Point Channel and Seaport Boulevard are or have been identified by the engineers as two uh, really vulnerable places for water to um, come into the city and to come not only um, affect the seaport, which some people may or may not care about given that it's a lot of high rise businesses, but, that, but it also comes pouring into South Boston and really has an impact um, on huge amounts of residential area as well. Those two little sections, which need to be addressed in the next five to 10 years are projected at 30 to $50 million of cost in each case. Who's paying for that? That's something that we have to figure out. We meaning the city, the GRC, every voter, every citizen in Boston. And that's just for those two little areas. So we clearly need something uh, we, we clearly need a movement or a campaign, um, some way of getting people's level of awareness and um, you know willingness to to put some assets and some and some effort behind this together. We need to ratchet that up. Um, Zoe talked about prepared and connected communities, and I think that's a start. But I think we have to really be thinking in terms of major campaign. So how do we do that? Um, I always, you know, I just love uh, E.O. Wilson. And he said, well, our problem, the problem of humanity is that we have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions and godlike technology. So we can fix things, so quote unquote, fix them or engineer them um, or plan for them so much better than we can envision. You know, we, ne we also need to have this process of visioning and feeling emotionally like we're moving in the right direction um, in order to want to do these things and not just have them sort of structurally imposed upon us. So I started thinking about two years ago, back when I was pulling the cultural institutions working group together, how do people actually get climate change? You know, is it by reading a report and hearing about metric tons of carbon in the atmosphere? Yes, for some people, but for a lot of people, mm -mm -mm, they don't think that way. And so, you know, what is it that creates a visceral sense of it? Something that touches your emotions or some other more immediate sense. And I started turning to the arts, you know, and I thought art, uh, movies, maps, 
history, um, technological experiences like at the Museum of Science, um, music, uh, gardens, nature, the, the Greenway, um, the Emerald Necklace Conservancy, food, um, things that we eat, all of these experiences can, can be a, a sort of a gateway into the issue of climate change for people. And so we pulled together this cultural institutions working group of the GRC, which now has about 42 different organizations in it, raising, ranging from Paul Revere to the Red Sox, to the ICA, to the um, zoo. It's great. It, it includes just this really large cross section of, of culturals. And what's exciting about what they can do is that they are trusted in a way that a lot of um, corporations and even sadly governments are not trusted today. Um, they also reach about 22 million people in a normal non COVID year. Um, and they're creative. They have ways of talking that aren't just the dry science reports. So we're working with this group now to drive awareness and action um, on behalf of the organizations themselves and the city and audiences. And we've, um, this is the current members. Actually, I think we have a few more than this um, by now. I think this is a slightly old slide, but you can get a sense of the variety. And um, we have a website that where we're uh, launching um, programming, meaning whatever programming you are doing that addresses the human condition, which is most programming, that can be related in some way as an opportunity to, to climate change in Boston as a teaching moment or an awareness building or an opening moment. Let's, let's put that in there. So there's a very cool website. We're going to do a soft launch within the next couple of weeks. Um, and so I just really want to thank and encourage all the you know, curators, artists, archaeologists, musicians, historians, and everybody else out there to please get involved and and don't just feel like this belongs in the realm of of the scientists, architects, engineers, and and um, you know, and construction people who are going to build a lot of seawalls. Um, not that you necessarily did think that, but in case, please do not. And um, I look forward to just doing more and more of this with. Um, with all of the different organizations in Boston, including Paul Revere. So thank you, Nina and Robert, for being part of um, our work together. And I am very easy to find. Um, GreenRibbonCommission.org has my website, has my email on the website. Thank you. All right, terrific. Thank you so much for that presentation, Amy. And I already seen some some points of uh, potential questions uh, bridging the bridging the two talks so far. So speaking of Nina, let's toss it over to uh, our executive director, Nina Zanieri, who will uh, run the uh, the anchor leg here on this uh, three person panel. Uh, thanks so much, Robert and and Amy and Zoe. Uh, my role tonight is to provide a bit of a case study uh, to sort of weave together how some of the things you've heard today uh, impact the way my association will need to consider uh, our own adaptation to sea level rise, temperature changes, groundwater changes, and certainly extreme weather patterns. Um, I wanna be clear that my institution is neither an example of innovation or even a high level of success but rather it's an example of where I would suggest many institutions of our size and discipline find ourselves, neither at the front nor at the back of the line, but certainly in a place of greater awareness with a commitment to do better. So who are we? The association was founded in 1907 to manage the restoration of the Paul Revere House. We now own three historic properties, um, the Paul Revere House, a 1680 property, the 1711 Hitchborn House and our newest building, uh, which is an 1835 uh, two family, which serves as our visitor center. In a normal year, our site would welcome 300,000 visitors. Um, we all come to the notion of climate change in different ways, whether it's personally through our field of practice, which for me is preservation museums and public history or operationally within our organizations. On a personal level, I wanna say that my initial introduction to environmental awareness 
was reading Rachel Carson's 1962 book, A Silent Spring, as a child. Though its focus was pesticides, her message warned of the damage being done by using long lasting toxic materials to produce what were perceived to be good outcomes. It was an effort to underscore the fact that progress fueled by chemicals has a dark side. Ironically, one could also say that, that this about the early green industry, where lots of instances of greenwashing were used to sell dubious solutions and products. Professionally, my journey, journey has been one of increased mindfulness tied to my work managing properties. Um, certainly my going to meetings of the Green Ribbon Commission and also attending some of their programs has been a, a great for me and a way to, to learn more. I will say that as many have mentioned, the real wake up call for many of us in Boston was the string of recent nor'easters that turned the lot where some of us occasionally park into a large ice rink with cars locked in frozen seawater and it pushed water from the harbor up past the New England Aquarium to the Greenway and to the foot of State Street. It made me wonder how soon will that water be at the door of the Paul Revere House. It's hard to miss the point when your feet are wet, but it's important not to wait that long. The museum and professional and the museum community and the preservation community on a national level have made measured progress in looking at climate and sustainability. Certainly there's no question in the last 10 years, there has been an increased sense of urgency. This awakening has been advanced by the work of people like Sarah Sutton with her book, The Green Museum and Environmental Sustainability and Historic Sites. Numerous articles in professional journals, workshops, the National Trust Rising Up to Rising Tides Conference, Newport Restoration Foundation's leadership on keeping history above water, which now is in its third year. And also the American Association of Museums um, new alignment with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So as a profession, we've certainly moved forward. History organizations perhaps have sat back on our heels a bit early on, mostly due to not quite knowing how to link our mission with a climate message, while science, children's, zoos, and aquarium have been out front. Heck, even with this lecture series, uh, there were a few folks who said to me, well, what does that have to do with Paul Revere? Well, a lot, in fact. On the other hand, as caretakers of old structures, we have, a long, we have long hung our hats on the fact that as many have noted, quote, the greenest building is the one that's already built. Historic preservation and conservation of historic landscapes signify the ultimate in recycling by celebrating reuse and rehabilitation. The National Trust for Historic Preservation is one of a number of organizations that's taken the lead on issues of going green and conservation. In 2008, then Trust President Richard Moe said, quote, any new building, no matter how much green technology it incorporates, represents new impact on the environment. An older building represents prior investment in resources and energy. If you tear it down, the investment is wasted. But if you keep using the building, you're conserving resources, end quote. To understand the challenges historic sites like our properties face, we have to begin by considering what makes us different. Cultural organizations, and Amy has certainly made this point, have a deep connection to their communities, and historic sites have an essential connection to place. Historic properties derive much of their meaning from place. Though some cultural organizations could move, and some have, it's not without serious ramifications for the communities that they abandon. It's why, for example, the Boston Children's Museum is confronting sea level challenges in place while articulating its response in the language of its educational mission. For historic buildings like the Paul Revere House, moving's not really a reasonable option. So we need to consider what the threats are and what we can do. Our work at the association is separated into operational issues, planning and capital projects, and the bigger picture, mitigation and mes messaging that's beyond our scope, but not beyond our participation and input. On an operational level, it's conservation and recycling, choosing paints and other building materials that are low VOC, durable and environmentally friendly, 
regular maintenance on systems and making good decisions when systems, fixtures, and lightings have to be replaced or upgraded, employing organic gardening practices, not chasing the newest office equipment, and recycling properly when things ultimately fail. Our approach to restoration has always been to save and repair clapboards, bricks, windows, basically valuing where possible old fabric over new. With regard to major projects, in 2007, we began the long process of rehabilitating an 1835 building into a visitor center. We had a more blank slate because it was virtually gutted. Still, internally, we had to balance all our own sometimes competing priorities, space, access, and green. We also found that we had to navigate a somewhat confusing and complex contradictory landscape of regulations, emphasis, and expectations. We're not alone in this realization. Traditional Building Magazine in 2015 noted, quote, we don't have a free hand as preservation ordinances still place some restrictions on what can be done. Regarding a project at Harvard, architect Nancy Trainer noted, quote, projects with goals for both preservation and sustainability requiring juggling a lot of variables. When we did our project, we encountered a somewhat frustrating lack of uniformity amongst all of the players from regulatory, the Mass Historical Commission, Boston Landmarks, Inspectional Services, Boston Water and Sewer, Boston Fire Department, to funding sources, to the museum profession, and to our practitioners, architects, engineers, and contractors. Not only did it require negotiating compliance, but also managing different knowledge bases and professional biases amongst architects, engineers, contractors, and even ourselves. Professional wisdom at any, on any given topic regularly shifts and can shift midstream, particularly during a project like ours that took forever. And changes, of course, add time and cost. Variances can be pursued, but they again generally add time and cost. We also encountered a lack of alignment between the U.S. Green Building Council lead requirements and our work on an older building. So we decided to do what we could, but not to try to pursue any level of certification. When noting this disconnect between perhaps green principles and historic preservation, traditional building magazine offered good news in a 2015 article stating, quote, only now is there a growing agreement on how to balance green and old. In the past, preservationists and green buildings have been on a collision course, but now they seem to be on the same path, which is really great news. There is no question that greening historic buildings can be accomplished with reductions in energy use, water use, use of environmentally safe materials, and the use of recycled building materials. So how did we do with our 1835 building? Well, we did the best we could. We sourced dual flush toilets, water fountains with bottom fillers, rehabilitated 19th century windows, made all our windows operable, added storms and screens, restored and kept interior brick walls, removed and replaced old clapboards, installed an HVA system with programmable thermostats that allow us to control by room and zone, but some systems, put some systems on the top floor of the building, uh, moved on to LED lighting systems with timers and dimmers. Though stuffing all the necessary equipment into a small building led to some compromises, as did fire suppression, insulation, and roofing. We also did a lot of work to make our landscape comply with green, the green groundwater conservation overlay district regulations. We basically took everything up and installed a massive drainage system with a dry well, and we tied all our building downspouts and area drains so that we would limit the groundwater going into the directly into sewer systems. We provided access, but when faced with taking a lot of great old brick to the landfill, we chose to save it rather than go with the preferred ADA new wire cut smooth brick. We lost garden and added hardscape. So again, we had trade-offs. One of the other challenges was of course funding. For our project, 
we had more luck raising funds, ironically, for handicap access than for green options. The access issues seem perhaps more tied to our public mission than did the green ideas. Cultural institutions <clears throat> generally have funding challenges. We need more funders to value sustainability, both environmental and financial, to help us be better. So what does the future hold for historic sites? As I noted, moving any of our properties would be a nuclear option, the last resort, and probably not even realistic. So we need to do what the Boston Children's Museum is doing, be proactive about what we can do organizationally, and advocate for broader, more far-reaching changes locally, regionally, and nationally. That means considering what our neighbors are doing and how our actions impact our neighbors. Responding to climate change is a matter of active mitigation from immediate daily actions, recycling, water and energy use, to making sure that planning around systems and structure modifications include issues of greening and resiliency, and to being engaged and informed as we look for ways to use collective action to produce bigger picture responses than would be possible for us alone. We need to be aware of the risks we face and the timeline. The issues, the larger and more profound issues seem at first glance beyond our control. Rising groundwater and rising sea levels in Boston, particularly the North End and extreme weather. Nationwide, there's no question that some historical resources have already been lost and others are currently threatened. Then there are the more complex issues of what to do with regulations that govern changes to historic buildings that create potential roadblocks, how do we address these and perhaps advocate for change? Some of these will happen as respected organizations show that even subtle changes can increase resiliency of historic buildings, particularly with the impact of extreme weather. Historic New England has done a lot of great work using its collection of historic properties to conduct blower tests to locate and manage air leaks, adopting gutter and downspout changes to accommodate heavier rains, and looking at drainage systems. Newport, Rhode Island has recently released new guidelines to regulate elevating threatened structures across threatened waterfront neighborhoods so that you don't have an odd situation where one building is raised and another is not. Lee Glazer noted, that it's about balancing historical integrity with modern values. There's also the issue of what standards are used to determine which old buildings have value. Standards that have often involved bias that has favored high style architecture and older versus newer, as well as connections to famous people, dominant culture and significant events. These same issues of equity are slowly changing our notion of historic value these must also come into play as we determine what gets saved, whether through, whether threatened by purposeful demolition or random acts of nature. As public historians, it's our job to help people understand the relevance of the past to the present and how to use that to determine a better future. History can sometimes look like an either or. On the one hand, it tells us that generally humans find a way and are resilient in the face of challenge while it also warns us that civilizations have vanished in the face of potentially insurmountable or unprecedented obstacles. David Glassberg, our colleague at UMass, adds another option, quote, historians can do more than help the public acclimate to unfamiliar change by showing how prior generations have successfully adopt, adapted to the inevitable. Historians can help build resiliency by telling stories about the past that avoid determinism and restore a sense of contingency and intention. Historic places have the ability to invoke passion and that passion can drive action. Because we all know that if we lose much of what binds us to place, we will lose a bit of our souls. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nina, that was Terrific, and we definitely have some questions uh, coming in. I have some questions of my own here, but I did want to offer um, 
all three of you, and no pressure here if 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 you don't have one ready. But uh, the chance to to respond to anything you just heard from your your co panelist, if this sparked a, a question, point of discussion, something you wanted to circle back to. So floor is yours for the moment, if you'd like it, and then we can transition to to questions after that. I I just want to say that I think that. I think the role of the Green Ribbon Commission and also the city, both in mobilizing cultural institutions, to your point, Amy, um, people take action when something they love is at risk. And I think that it also allows us to message in a way that perhaps is a small hammer rather than a big hammer and perhaps allows people to come to things as they will rather than feel that they it's, it's too much, they have to walk away from it, they can't think about it, it's too sciencey. that doesn't interest them. So I really applaud what the Green Ribbon Commission has done, and I think the city has also acknowledged that cultural institutions have a, have a real role to play in this, in this particular topic. Thank you for saying that, and I, I should say, you know, when we first started talking about encouraging programming, and, and a lot of people at the different organizations we were working with was, were saying, well, um, but we, you know, we don't do that kind of programming. But when they started really digging in, and this lecture series is a perfect example. It's like, maybe on the surface, you wouldn't think that Paul Revere, you know, the museum that Paul Revere House was sort of like about climate change, quote unquote, but you've, you've, made that connection very, very clear and obvious. And you're bringing a dimension, a historical dimension to it that is enriching everyone's thinking. Um, so, and, and there's a lot of that once people got going and they also started talking about cross fertilization. So a theater talking to a science museum, well, maybe we could come and do a performance in your, to your audiences who aren't expecting that kind of thing there in that space. Because I think there's also something to be said for the counterintuitiveness of where you find information, you know. Um, and also just one thing I'll say about the fundraising, uh, you mentioned how hard it is to fundraise for green. And I know Carol Chernow at the Children's Museum who has quite um, a lot, uh, a, a big fundraising goal so that she can make the changes she needs to make because she's right there on the harbor and getting flooded. Um, and she's the one who sort of got me thinking this way about helping, one thing we can do is help uh, development staff yeah. learn the right language and learn how to build the case to donors that this kind of work is, the, is resilience and mitigation work is very relevant to the institution's future. Yeah, yeah and that's yeah. actually a similar question, sorry. Oh, I was I was just gonna add very quickly that I was really intrigued with your exposition on um, how just the intersectionality, the intersectionality with um, cultural institutions and climate adaptation, you're totally right that the solutions to climate change, um, they're not just for the planners and the engineers of the world um, <clears throat> because climate, it affects everyone. And so everyone is needed to help develop holistic and innovative ways to move forward. So yeah, I just wanted to um, to say that, um, that I really appreciated that. So we have a few questions of, of somewhat similar themes, I would say here. Um, one of them is is taking this question, and I, I think to some of those points that, that Nina was was making about um, reuse, not chasing the newest thing all the time. At, at what level, and this might be more Zoe and Amy, do you see that fitting into maybe even larger organizations trying to make those moves? Is that is that realistic? How does that, how would that motivating process play out in, in your mind? Um, so there's two, two thoughts there, I believe. One is sort of the idea that the greenest, the greenest building is the building that's, that already exists. And I think that is sometimes true and sometimes not true. It is true, there's a lot of embedded carbon in any building, but if it's operating 
in such a way that is so leaky and so fuel, carbon fuel intensive, um, then that might not actually be the case. So I think that's a kind of a sometimes yes, sometimes no. In terms of the moving, I don't know. I went to one of those keeping history above water um, conferences uh, last year, and there was a really fascinating presentation from an archaeologist who was working on a site on the coast of England or Scotland, I forget. Uh, and they and this was Paleolithic, this was Stone Age, and it was getting washed away because of sea level rise. And they just numbered all the stones and they were just moving this entire thing three miles inland. I, my mind was blown because I'd always thought, well, you can't move an archaeological site. Isn't that completely oxymoronic? Um, but on the other hand, I do really feel like these institutions, cultural and business and you know, and education, like Boston is just, it is, it's collection of great universities, great hospitals, the MFA, et cetera, et cetera, and wonderful neighborhoods. And so it's not just like you could move it to Springfield and it would be the same thing. So there's this huge sense of these brand co-branded institutions, co-branded with Boston, you know, MIT, or well, that's maybe a little Cambridge-y, but you know what I mean? Like you, you don't want to, <laughs> we've got to figure out a way to try for as long as we can to, to, to shore up and keep going. I, I don't know. That's yeah. Um, and a, another question that we had, I, I, I think that's taking a different tack somewhat on this is obviously the moment that we're in right now with the pandemic and thinking about not just climate change, but what do even best practices broadly construed look like in this moment? Um, the, the question that came in was referencing the amount of PPE that we see around, um, you know, just in terms of, you know, recycling and waste, um, thinking about for, for what you both mentioned, Zoe and Amy, um, heat and cooling centers and large scale cooling centers becoming more necessary. In your opinion, how, how does this sort of jigsaw puzzle work, both with the pandemic and then some of the practices that are being put in place to mitigate the, the effects of climate change? Yeah, so in this season, what we've been thinking, just, um, just looking back, is that the sort of this, this notion around social networks and the social networks of resilience. And um, just that these are the same networks that we might see in a climate crisis, um, the same networks of support and communication um, with community-based organizations, um, with the public health department. You know, we're seeing those actively um, respond in this in this situation and so I think there's there's an element of like when we're seeing um, really significant climate impacts that the city has the ability the city and its people has the ability to be okay in this um, but I I think from this situation what we're learning is um, it just underscores that climate change doesn't happen in a vacuum and COVID-19 didn't happen in a vacuum. There's a number, there's just intersectionality um, with many factors, um, with, you know, public health and transportation and access when we're thinking about um, cooling centers, with access to cooling, um, with housing affordability and what that means for being able to pay utilities um, matters of race and social equity. And so um, they were just seeing that there's a significant amount of intersectionality with many of these um, really sort of critical um, aspects of everyday life. Um, and so it's it's sort of having us, you know, rethink, especially along the lines of access, where, where is it that we need to uh, be um, sort of either providing better communication or better uh, modes for folks to access cooling or shelters or food. Um, and so that's sort of 
what we've been thinking about during this time? I mean, in, in some in some ways, the the lack of equity and the, the issues around <clears throat> both the pandemic, but also climate change. I think there is a, a lot of reckoning that we're all dealing with now about understanding that some communities have borne more impact from a lot of things than perhaps we would have liked to think. And it's 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 from it's it's the the buildings we save. It's the uh, it's, it's the neighborhoods that get services or don't get services. Um, so I think there's both issues, climate and, and the pandemic and, and a lot of things have really, I think in this particular moment, really put a spotlight on issues of equity that we all have to think about. I also think it's really, everyone's dealing with the fact that there's now millions of gloves that are out there and, and masks and things that are in the trash and being thrown out and um, that have become necessary tools of this particular moment in time and we don't really have a great solution for them. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. I, I think there's an um, opportunity and I really look forward to your work, Zoe, on heat and the city's work on heat um, to, to again bring history to the to the four, because how did we get here? So we have these hot neighborhoods, way too hot for people to be healthy in, and some neighborhoods are way hotter than other neighborhoods because they have less green. And they also are neighborhoods where people have to wait for buses out on the street. And it's, you know, like there's reasons that all, that all of that happened, like redlining and lack of mortgage lending and all kinds of things that happen if you, scratch the surface back into the history of this city and many, many other cities. Um, but I think, you know, really whatever we can do, I don't know if you would agree with this, Zoe, but I, th I feel like anything that we can do to help people understand how do we get to this point? What was my role in it, personal or the larger we? Um, and then how can we make a difference? How can we change it? Yeah, that is a a really critical piece of the project moving forward um, is to take a step back, you know, not just immediately diving into the future projections, but to take a step back and and look at the history um, and look at the components that you mentioned that have led us to this point so that we can say, you know, this is how we did things in the past. We have an opportunity to plan things with uh, with the community working through equity, how do we how do we build for the future? Um, you know, knowing that we we don't want to make the same choices that we made in the past. So I'm glad that you you brought that up because looking at um, the history of how Boston was formed. Um, is going to be a, a critical piece of uh, developing the heat resilience plan. Yeah, look forward to working on that with you. There's also a deeper irony that just popped into my head is that the wonderful thing about some of the old buildings and certainly our new visitor centers, we have these wonderful operable windows and there's been all this concern in COVID about fresh air and buildings that are tightly sealed that don't have great systems. So there's also this um, this sense that sometimes those, those old windows that at least open and give you some fresh air are, are helping at this moment in time. So how do we how do we take some of those lessons and use them to make whatever buildings we have, whether they're old buildings that we work to to make better or new buildings that have to we have to work on to make better. How do we address all those different different issues? And, and again, that, that's that's the challenge when you're working on a building project is you're trying to do multiple different things. But how do we take the lessons from old buildings and, and use them to perhaps make even better new buildings? Yeah, I've heard some of our um, real estate colleagues with big buildings talk about how the air exchange requirements for in during the pandemic are completely blowing their carbon budgets because of the energy required to 
do many more air exchanges a day. I don't know the numbers, but that's the that's the concept. Yeah. And I'm sure those are mostly inoperable windows. So your point yeah. is well taken. <laughs> Now on the on the second half of the the panel title today, and and everyone here has spoken to this to to some extent, but on the where do we go from here? I think one of the questions that we've had, um, and 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 both uh, Zoe and Amy, you spoke to this, but it's it's the question of 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 focus and attention, and and really the attention span of 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 individuals uh, in this moment of certainly COVID, of Black Lives Matter, of police reform, of the upcoming election, as we know here, how how do we keep a focus on climate change and the very uh, you know planning processes and and you know intersectionalities that that everyone's discussed here? How do we keep a focus on that? And I know this is for certainly for Zoe and Amy, this is this is what you do on a on a on a daily basis as well. Um, how how do you see this? The, the momentum or the focus stay on, on the topic? So I'll just add from at least many of the conversations that I have had, people, especially in the Boston area, recognize that climate change is an issue. They feel that it is hot. Um, as was mentioned on one of the presentations, we don't need a study to tell ourselves that it's that it is getting hot people experience the flooding in their homes. And so I think as we're sort of gearing up to do these planning processes, it's not like we have to sort of get people to pay attention. I think where, um, um, where we can sort of continue to work is again, understanding that these issues don't happen in a vacuum. And so while while in a planning process, we might be focusing on coastal resilience of a specific coastline. In the conversation, if community members are saying, well, hey, transportation and, and access to this place is really important to me. Um, you know, we, we have to recognize that we're developing plans with communities, with real people, with, you know, real life uh, that experience real life consequences. And so I think it's about also recognizing um, the realities that people live in while we, you know, move forward in climate adaptation. Yeah, I I was going to say something similar. I really agree with that. Uh, it's it's um, and again, it sort of relates to this idea of making sure we're science based, but not leaving the the narrative in the realm of science purely. So you know. Are your elderly parents going to stay cool enough on this day when the weather is supposed to be, you know, it's supposed to be 101 degrees out? Or, um, you know, you live in East Boston in a low lying neighborhood um, and there's a storm coming. You know, it's, it's that, that's almost too literal. Um, it, it's more about weaving it into pieces of daily life that you begin to notice. And it's also about thinking about the future. What do we want the future to be? I think the climate movement has done itself a disservice. This is very like high level climate movement for decades by being really gloom and doom, which on one level is valid and true. And on the other level, doesn't give people a lot to dream about. So in 2016, we took the Green River Commission members to, on a trip to um, the Netherlands and looked at looked at sort of the way they're sort of pitching the story, if you will, in Amsterdam and Rotterdam and Copenhagen. And it's much more about, don't you want a better quality of life? Don't you want to be able to hear the birds and not have so much traffic noise and be able to have room for your community garden and ride your kids to school on their bikes? Um, it, it, you know, it, it, it was really sort of touching the personal story. So I think that's part of, that's an important piece of it. And I think room to vision and dream and just think about it in different ways, which is where I really still think arts and culture comes in as well as learn our own history. Yeah, and I, and I think uh, the, the comments from David Glassberg about public history and not, not making it be an either or, you're either gonna uh, adapt or you're gonna, you're gonna be extinct and how you, how you make that balance, but I, I all, it's why 
well, I hate to go back to it, but, but Rachel Carson's book, A Silent Spring, for me as a kid, understanding that what she was saying was that all of those wonderful sounds that are so life affirming, birds, and that, that if we didn't clean up our act, if we didn't do something different, those things would be gone. So it's about, well, okay, what can we do in small ways to keep that from happening? And, and you know, we still have birds singing, but we certainly have issues with regards to um, how we deal with pesticides and toxic chemicals and other things. We've done a much better job, but there's still, still room in that. And I, I think people do, Amy, want something to look forward to. They want to think that they can be part of positive action to improve something rather than um, there's no way to fix it. And on, on that point, actually, and we're just about running up on time here, but I did want to give all three of you, and maybe this is a point that, you want to, that you've made before, and I think we have had a lot of uh, positivity in all of these talks, so maybe countering that gloom and doom narrative that you mentioned, Amy. Um, if the three of you have something that you think is going really well that you want to highlight, or it, there is a positive story, and again, maybe this is something that, that, that you you want to reinforce from from one of your talks tonight, but I wanted to give all three of you an opportunity to, you know, maybe have a, a closing word or a statement or or highlight something that you think really is 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 going well in, in Boston at the moment. I would I would just give credit to the city overall. Um, I think it's been very far sighted. I think a ton of planning work is done. It's sort of nearing the end and time to implement. Um, done a good job of engaging a lot of different parts of the city. More to come. The heat thing is new, but um, you know, I, I think now we have to really just work to implement what we know is possible. And part of that involves finding ways to administer and finance the work. And this is like muscle memory that the city government does not have. It's not their fault. No one had to deal with the climate crisis before, but now we do. So we have to figure out what that looks like. And I hope that will go as well and as swiftly as the planning work has done, <laughs> has gone. Yeah, I can, I can just echo that um, as sort of I, I mentioned before in my presentation that once the, the final phase of East Boston and Charlestown is complete, we will have finished planning for the coastline, um, which is really it's a exciting. lot of miles. Yeah, a lot of miles. Um, but then you're right, Amy, what what comes next is um, the implementation piece and all of that and all of what that entails. Um, I think, though, in, in all of these conversations, uh, what we've also realized is um, that it's that we're sort of excited to be, you know, not just building into our, uh, not just building up the sort of infrastructure uh, and, and buildings uh, planning on that side, but also to be, um, you know, building up social resilience and connecting more with community partners, with community-based organizations, and building resilience in, in that way, which is just as much a part of, uh, of climate resilience as uh, being resilient in the, in the physical built environment. Well, can I, can I just also add something, you know, talk about history layering on itself. Look at what we benefit now that was planned and built before. So the Emerald Necklace Conservancy is a Olmstead Park that goes all the way through the city, the Public Garden, um, the Rose County Greenway, more recent, but th that's there, the, um, the Arnold Arboretum, the zoo. We've got amazing resources that could have been just built on, right? But it, they weren't because they were, someone thought about it back then, whenever then was. And now we have the same opportunity to transform the city or to improve it or to do something that, you know, I hope people will be looking back on 100, 150, 200 years from now saying, yeah, they did this then when they had this climate crisis thing that they had to figure out how to deal with. 
Right. Maybe, maybe that'll be the 47 miles of protected shorelines, Zoe. <laughs> yeah. Nina, do you have any closing yeah. thoughts? For me, it's it's really been watching, I think, the, the museum field, the public history field, the preservation field, uh, grapple with this topic, uh, come up with ways to, to talk about different options, things to do, and also watching in Boston, other cultural institutions. I mentioned the, the Children's Museum. I think it's wonderful how they are. They're, they're addressing an issue, but they're doing it within their mission. They're using it as an educational moment. And the more funding they get, uh, the more they'll be able to do. And I think that's great. Also, um, again, places like Historic New England that are experimenting with options within historic buildings that we might all learn from and, and, and do better with. So when you've got um, smart people uh, and colleagues who are thinking about these things, it's an opportunity to, to be better yourself and to also help others be better. All right. Well, that was a good note to end on. I think we'll close with that, Nina. Um, we are up on time here. So um, I do want to thank all three of our panelists tonight. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Nina. This was terrific. Uh, I think it was a really great close to this lecture series that gave us these snapshots, again, of these conversations happening in the 17th century, in the 18th century, certainly in the 19th century, and a, a glimpse with some really great perspectives of of where we are today and, and where we might be going in, in the future. Uh, thank you all for tuning in tonight. Uh, as a reminder, if you wanna catch this lecture, if you wanna revisit any of the conversations that we've had here, um, you can do so on both our Facebook page and our YouTube channels. Um, so you can catch up on any of these conversations and please stay in touch with us if you wanna continue the conversation uh, or continue the conversation with our panelists um, as, as, as things uh, progress here. Uh, we also want to say thank you very much to Revolutionary Spaces and uh, the Green Ribbon Commission, our partners for this, and another uh, shout out, of course, to the Lowell Institute, uh, whose generous funding allows this programming to happen. Uh, thank you for watching, and hopefully we'll see. Uh, hope to see everybody maybe in a, a hybrid format next year uh, to continue this uh, digital format and uh, perhaps in person in September of 2021. So that'll do it for our series. Uh, thank you again for tuning in.